not going to talk about healthcare so much as I'm going to talk about uh, what we can learn from the consumer internet and Silicon Valley and what it has done with data so far and some lessons there. There's this great quote that I like to use from Edwin Schlossberg who once said, the skill of writing is to create a context in which other people can think. And I'm going to try to provide some context for thinking about data and some lessons uh, from things that you probably already know and that you might not just have thought about what they teach us. So let me start out with uh, this recent paper by uh, uh, someone from Facebook and someone from Cornell with the title, Romantic Partnerships and the Dispersion of Social Ties, a Network Analysis of Relationship Status on Facebook. Or as it was reported by Time Magazine, Facebook knows when you're going to get dumped. Uh, you know, uh, uh, these are examples of what Peter Norvig, Alan Halavy, and Fernando Pereira called the unreasonable effectiveness of data in a paper that they wrote uh, in homage to Eugene Wigner's famous paper, The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics. And this paper uh, wrote about how Google's uh, efforts in speech recognition and in translation benefited from having just more data. They said, we don't have better algorithms than other people, we just have more data. And uh, making the case that sometimes simple algorithms and more data trumps uh, complex algorithms. And I found that, that same thing come up in conversations with uh, Jeremy Howard at Kaggle. Uh, you know, he says, I said, what determines the people who win the Kaggle you know, data wrangling contest? What do they know that other people don't? He said, actually, it's, they're all using the same algorithms. It's just how creative they are in bringing new data to bear uh, to solve the problem. And of course, you know, Watson uh, has raised uh, for all of us uh, the prospect of uh, big data uh, having an impact in healthcare. Uh, but I want to sort of take this unreasonable effectiveness of data issue and start to unpack it a little bit. So with some lessons and questions from the consumer internet. So the first lesson is from Analytics Hulk, who says, Hulk, look at Twitter, similar to you list. Why similar? Nobody green. I'll have unripped shirt. Smash Twitter algorithm. So clearly, there's something uh, that all the algorithms don't work, uh, at least according to Analytics Hulk. But more seriously, taking a look at Google, I guess you guys aren't Hulk fans, because that joke didn't go over very well. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, taking a look at Google, I mean, it is, uh, there's so many interesting lessons going all the way back to the beginning. But the first one is it starts with open data. You know, this incredible opportunity that Tim Berners-Lee created by uh, making a plain, simple, open format that anybody could use, software that anybody could use, so that we could all share our work product freely on the web. And we built this enormous infrastructure uh, together, which Google then can learn from. There's this huge corpus that we made. Uh, and Clay Shirky had this wonderful insight about how the web inverted the paradigm. He said the old notion of filter, then publish, is giving way to publish, then filter. And of course, we see this uh, in scientific literature with uh, uh, open access journals like PLOS One. I love their statement, PLOS One will rigorously peer review your submissions and publish all papers that are judged to be technically sound. Judgments about importance are then made after publication by the readership. And that's sort of trying to apply uh, the web model to science. Uh, I'm really proud to be part of PeerJ, which is uh, one of our investments, another open access journal. Uh, it's a fantastic movement, and it's a key uh, um, to, to the future of uh, data in healthcare. Uh, but we need more than just text. You know, the web started out as a text medium. We added pictures, but gradually we've added more and more kinds of data. And I want to point you to a document called the Panton Principles, done by some people at Oxford, uh, arguing that every scientific paper should be accompanied by its data, so that open access shouldn't just be for the papers themselves, but for the data on which the papers are based. And again, you start thinking about that and you realize how much more is going to be possible when Watson is, is scanning not just uh, the text of the papers, but the actual underlying data. And of course, we're not just talking about data from scientific uh, studies. As we've discussed already at this event, uh, the quantified self is producing enormous amounts of consumer data, uh, some of it of enormous scientific importance. 
particularly remembering that unreasonable effectiveness of data. Disquantified self uh, data needs to be brought into the same frame as uh, actual scientific studies. This is actually just from the quantified self blog, somebody tracking five months of their sleep data. Uh, a key part of what we have to get to, of course, is for people to be able to share their data. John Wilbanks uh, from Sage Bionetworks, uh, uh, with Sage Bionetworks, was working on this portable legal consent idea so that people could say, oh yeah, you can use my data. Uh, we just started a project uh, at O'Reilly, uh, working with a large uh, research institution uh, to kind of uh, create an infrastructure where people could share quantified self data, uh, data from large clinical studies, put it into a, a kind of an open source backplane uh, to enable a correlation and analysis. And our, our idea really is that uh, if we can have an open source platform for this, we can get more people doing it and hopefully get more people sharing uh, data in a way that's reusable. Because we have a tendency to create silos where you'll see somebody saying, well, okay, we have our platform, we're gonna be the aggregator. Uh, I'd like to see something that works like the web, uh, where data is shared widely and freely, and there are people who are coming along later, like Google came along and took this wonderful open infrastructure and then said, how can we add value? And they figured out how to do that. So the second lesson from Google, and it's one that I see them exploiting in again and again and again in multiple ways, is to explore the possibilities of human-machine symbiosis. Now, I got that term from a wonderful paper by J.C.R. Licklider, who was, uh, among other things, the DARPA program manager who funded the early work on the internet. This paper was called, in the uh, argot of the day, man-computer symbiosis. I updated it to human-computer symbiosis. Um, and he said, the hope is that in not too many years, human brains and computing machines will be coupled together very tightly, and that the resulting partnership will think as no human brain has ever thought and process data in a way not approached by the information handling machines we know today. This is a wonderful framing concept with which we should be looking at the questions of data and the questions of user interface and the questions of computing. How are we building new ways for humans and computers to work together? And it's not always obvious when there is a human-computer symbiosis at work. So you, you think about Google's initial uh, actually, I'm going to go back first. Uh, you think about Google's initial insight uh, of PageRank. Uh, the, the fact that people were linking to documents was more important than the text in the documents as a key to search. You look at the way that they uh, interpret what people do when they click on links. If you, for example, click on a link on the page of Google search results, you go away, you come right back, they say, aha, that mustn't have been the right link. You, you click on a link, you go away, you stay away for a long time, never come back, they go, oh, they must have been satisfied, or if you come back after a while and look. So they look at your, your um, browsing pattern, and that actually tells them something. So they're always harvesting our input to make Google better. So this is human-computer symbiosis, and it's led me to this core idea that the heart of the modern uh, data revolution is to build systems that get better the more people use them. They really are systems for harnessing collective intelligence. So uh, another great example of this from Google, they recently acquired Waze, which is a crowdsourced traffic uh, map. Everybody sort of uh, reporting their, in, in, their, the application reporting in real time how fast or how slow they're going, allows uh, uh, people to, to um, identify choke points on the roads. Uh, there's also manual reporting. Anyway, this is another example of how increasingly the consumer internet depends on this collective intelligence aspect. But look at this project. Does this look like collective intelligence, the Google Autonomous Vehicle? Not really. It's pretty damn cool, but, but think about it for a moment. Uh, how does this thing work? Here, in uh, 2005, the DARPA Grand Challenge winner went seven miles in seven hours. And then six years later, Google has a car that's driven hundreds of thousands of miles in ordinary traffic. What did Peter say? He said, we don't have better algorithms, we just have more data. That's the unreasonable effectiveness of data once again. But the curious thing is, what kind of data? Guess what? It was Google Street View. You know, we thought those things were just driving around taking pictures so we'd have cute little turn-by-turn -turn directions. It turned out they were measuring the roads. You know, Peter said to me, he said, it's kind of a hard AI problem to pick a traffic light out of a video camera, but it's really trivial to figure out if it's red or green when you already know that it's there. You know, so they actually analyzed, measured, 
uh, you know, the roads exactly, and that's part of the input. So effectively, this is collective intelligence at work. That Google autonomous car is driving, remembering the last time that road was driven by a human being, a human being augmented with sensors. So again, here's this interesting design pattern of how do you actually get humans and computers to work together in new and creative ways? You know, robotic surgery is in the same category. So lesson three from Google, enrich your base layers. You know, take mapping. Oh, actually, I'm, I'm going to jump off. Sorry. Uh, 23andMe does this. You, know, you start with genome data. You start adding uh, phenotype data via surveys. Uh, but you know, uh, this, this other issue, this enriching your base layers, also leads to one of the principles that I talked about in my original Web 2.0 paper, which is that data ends up becoming the intel inside. That is the source of lock-in and monopoly. Uh, and so if you look at mapping, for example, uh, you know, we start with uh, open government data, maps that have been created over hundreds of years, made available freely, everybody builds on them. Uh, you know, and then you start adding more and more layers. You know, you've got street view, you've got pictures, you've got reviews, you, you know, Google starts adding more and more stuff, so it becomes more and more proprietary. You know, here's a, a picture I took recently of uh, some Google people with Google Trail View, right? They're, uh, they're actually carrying a little, uh, you know, 360-degree uh, camera hiking trails outside of Tucson. And, of course, they've actually even done Google Street View for the Amazon River. This is starting to build more and more proprietary data on top of that base layer of data. Uh, so that's part of why I think we, we actually need to um, be very aware of uh, this need for open data uh, and for an open source framework and platform for us to share health data with each other because it's quite possible that someone will emerge as the dominant player in health data. They will use that dominance to build a database that's better than everyone else's because there are increasing returns in data. There's sort of a natural monopoly when you build systems that get better the more people use them. The more data you have, the better your system is, uh, and therefore people use your system preferentially. And one of the counters to this is to have an open system that allows other people uh, to participate, uh, to play, to innovate. So um, I urge you to think about open data in all that you think about with data. I want to move on to another company uh, for, yet an, for a different lesson, and that is Square. How many people here have ever used a, a Square product or gone to a coffee shop with, uh, you know, with, with Square Register, you know, where you literally walk in, you know, if you're running the Square uh, wallet app, you, know, you walk in, you show up on the cash register, you walk up, they say, are you Tim? And I say yes, and they go, okay, great. Uh, and they, you know, basically hand me my coffee and I walk out. I mean, how cool is that? There's a couple of lessons here that are really important. First one, get creative with hardware, not just software. Square started with this little dongle, uh, you know, that allowed them to turn any phone into a credit card reader. They uh, have moved on from there, but it was a great starting point. And obviously we see this with a lot of the quantified self devices out on the show floor. Uh, as well as uh, around the, uh, the internet. Uh, hardware creativity is a huge part of the future, and we're going to see new kinds of devices driving new kinds of data. Uh, you know, years ago when I, when I popularized the term Web 2.0, people thought it was a version number, and they, and they would always say, well, what's Web 3.0? And I would say, well, it was really about the, the comeback of the web after the dot-com bust. But if it were a version number and there were a newer ver version, it would be when people when collective intelligence applications were driven by data from sensors rather than from people typing on keyboards. And that's pretty much the way it's, it's played out. So hardware, not just software, super important. But there's another lesson from Square that's so important. Do less. You know, that idea that you can have an interface where you don't even take the app out of your pocket is so important. You know, we're still in the world where we think we have to tell our computer to do something. And I think the, there's a big arc, which we also saw in the Google driverless car, where you take data and you actually have the device or the, the system make decisions. You know, it starts out, to go back, back to that, that Google self-driving car and Google Maps, we start with a map, and wow, the first stages, we, we make it interactive, and we can do this interactive visualization, we can look at it, we can interact with it, we can you know, put 
additional information on it, like I want directions from here to there. But if you look at the end game, you don't even need to look at the map anymore. The visualization was a halfway house because the car knows how to get there. And I think in a similar way, with increasingly with our devices becoming smarter, having senses of their own, uh, having capabilities of their own, the job of the interface is to figure out what is the uniquely human part of this. So for me, for example, when I walk into the coffee shop with Square, the only thing I have to do is turn on the app. Everything else is put to other parts of the system. So that do less exploration in the world of sensors is going to be huge you know, because we're still kind of bound up in the old paradigm where we type things, we tell things, we frame things for our devices, and increasingly uh, they're going to do them uh, automatically. The, the next lesson I have, uh, also from Square, is to build software above the level of a single device. It's a great framing that was originally uh, put forth by David Stutz when he left Microsoft 10, 10 12 years ago. Uh, he said this, this, he was talking about invention and he said there's plenty of money to be made building software above the level of a single device. Almost everything interesting today fits into this category. Sure there's maybe some games that you play on the device but it's so important to remember that the device is part of a bigger system. The internet is the platform and when you build beyond the level of a single device you, you, you get into cloud data. You know, again, think about that autonomous vehicle. It's not a freestanding thing. It's got the global brain remembering the roads. It's got, uh, uh, you know, a, a data collection component as well as a data consumption component. Uh, and, and this is a design pattern that you should think, think about throughout everything you work on in healthcare. Uh, a great example of software above the level of a single device uh, as well as some of these other patterns, is also Uber. How many here have, have, have actually used Uber? Fantastic service that lets you call a cab or a black car, or now increasingly just simply a, uh, you know, somebody who signs up to drive you in their own vehicle. Uh, Prius has seemed to be quite popular, called UberX. Uh, UberX is actually cheaper than a cab. Uh, but it's, what's amazing about it is that it connects you into a system with the driver. You know where they are, they know where you are. They come pick you up, they text you when they, uh, 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 they're about to arrive. There's a secure private channel where they don't actually get your phone number, but it's sort of routed. Again, very complex software above the level of a single device. So you can talk to them, but they actually don't get your phone number, uh, so they can't bother you later, whatever. So, but there's this other lesson from, from uh, Uber, which is that they rethought the workflow of getting a cab. And they totally transformed the experience. And there's this great uh, uh, tweet from Aaron Levy, uh, the CEO and founder of Box. He said, Uber is a $3.5 billion lesson in building for how the world should work instead of optimizing for how the world does work. When a new technology comes in, we very often try to graft it onto our existing workflows rather than saying, how could we do this differently? And I think the best uh, new projects are going to take a clean sheet of paper and say, how would we do this if we didn't have the constraints of the existing system? So a little bit uh, in terms of this workflow thing, uh, what we're trying to do with one of our portfolio companies, Sherpa, uh, which is basically putting the physician uh, and uh, various kinds of other specialists at uh, the immediate disposal of consumers. It's basically currently only working in New York City, uh, but uh, it's basically, you know, you'd kind of, just like you'd like to be able to call a private driver with Uber, you'd kind of like to be able to call your doctor on the spot or call a doctor or an insurance professional and get advice on the spot. Well, that's reinventing it in the way that Aaron uh, su suggested that Uber is. Here's another example of reinventing workflows uh, using data and devices. The Apple Store. You know, you walk into a big box store, you're desperate to find a salesperson. Apple is swarming with salespeople, right? And they're all equipped with superpowers in the form of their smartphones. They can check inventory, they can just check you out and hand you the product and you walk out the door. You know, that's rethinking workflows and experiences using devices and data uh, to change it. And I think that's ultimately the significance of Google Glass. I was interested to see a, 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 a surgery uh, with Google Glass display out on the show floor. Seems to me that in a, a healthcare context is gonna be one of the great opportunities for these kinds of displays. 
where do you actually have people uh, who need information on the spot. I could also imagine these with, uh, you know, uh, again, we'll also have this with tablets and, and phones for home healthcare aids and so on. How do you bring data to people who need it in ways that transform the workflow of healthcare? That's going to be one of the really big opportunities. Another lesson uh, from Uber is to close the loop. You think about it, what makes it so special is you know that the cab is two minutes away. You can watch them coming towards you on the map, on the screen of the app. You can see when they got, they, they got stuck in traffic and are delayed longer than you thought because it's actually closing the loop constantly for you. You have that communication ability. You're not just sort of in this unknown state. So that closing the loop aspect is a key part of, I think, this next generation of, of applications. Uh, I, I, that particular terminology came from uh, Chris Saka, who used to do special projects at Google and uh, who uh, was an early investor in Uber. That's also the uh, framing uh, metaphor of the paper I wrote last year about data in healthcare. Uh, I used the image of the Wanamaker problem, which was also so powerful for, uh, for, for Google. Google solved this problem that was stated in the late 1900s by, uh, sorry, late 1800s by John Wanamaker, the department store magnate. He said, half of my advertising doesn't work. The only problem is I don't know which half. And uh, you know, Google really solved that problem by actually measuring what ads worked, uh, letting people bid on uh, 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 selling the ads not to the highest bidder, but to, the, to the, the ad that would be most likely to actually connect. And that's, of course, what we're trying to do in healthcare. We're trying to close the loop. Um, Next lesson from uh, Silicon Valley is people will try to game the system. You know, we had this wonderful search engine and it started to have lots of problems because there were people who were sitting there going, well, I can figure out how to optimize the site so that you'll point uh, to um, uh, something that you shouldn't. So a, a good example of this, just this morning, I was uh, uh, searching for the, that Clay Shirky quote, uh, which I have used before. I eventually found it in one of my own previous slides. But uh, I was searching on the internet and I found, oh my God, you know, a Cialis ad masquerading as Clay Shirky, right? And it was like, whoa, how did they get in there? They poisoned his cash in some way and, and you know, there it is. Uh, so Black Hat SEO. And so Google ha has to actually do things uh, to, to fix this. They have a search quality team that has pretty aggressive and, you know, powerful work to figure out if search results are good. Uh, it's kind of like spam detection in a lot of ways, but there's also just, you know, this, this positive and, you know, battling black hats. But, you know, we're going to have to do that with data quality. We have to have a data quality function in healthcare. You know, we've heard stories uh, about healthcare.gov about how bad the data is that's coming out of that, uh, that site. We can't have that. We've got to have uh, data quality be front and center. But there's another piece here. Uh, and this, uh, when they first started the Google search quality blog, this is back in, I think, 2008, Udi Mamber talked about how they couldn't reveal everything because uh, the more they revealed about the algorithms, the more they gave fuel to the people who were gaming them. So they were trying to say, we're trying to walk a balance between explaining what we do and giving too much away. And we do, I think, increasingly, for a number of reasons, uh, we're going to live in a future that John Madison has talked about really well. He, uh, when he said the great question of the 21st century is whose black box can you trust? You know, that Google self-driving car is a black box. The, uh, you know, Google search results are a black box. Uh, healthcare recommendations uh, are increasingly going to be a black box. Now, we need uh, the ability to audit and inspect those black boxes, but we may not have complete access, and we're going to have to accept uh, some level of trust as required. So uh, I think that we're going to have to wrestle with those issues over the next uh, decades. You know, can we trust this data? Can we trust this algorithm? How do we figure out whether we can trust it or not? And the last lesson I want to leave you with, uh, which is the one that I, I think is sort of central to my career and my approach, is that innovation starts with people having fun. That's why the quantified self is such an important part of this story that we're t telling here. It's not just about scientific research. There's a great uh, uh, blog post or uh, article in Make Magazine uh, called Makers, the New Explorers of the Universe by David Lang of OpenROV, which is basically, a, it's kind of like the, uh, 
It's like an undersea drone. So think of it. It's, it's an underwater uh, vehicle that's uh, remote controlled or can, can uh, navigate on its own. And uh, he talks about citizen exploration, not just citizen science. He says the pallid idea of citizen science is you get to contribute to uh, the, the uh, work of some scientist, you know, by being, you know, the grunt labor, you know, in, uh, say, an astronomical survey or ornithological survey, whatever. He's saying, no, no, we actually can enable citizen explorers. And uh, I think that's really a lot of what's happening with the quantified self. We are following our curiosity. We're actually trying to learn. And that is actually going to produce a huge amount of data, which then can be crunched and added to the scientific uh, 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 corpus. So that's really kind of my, my uh, key you know, thesis at our venture firm, that innovation starts uh, with enthusiasts. So we look for areas where people are having fun, and we look for how it's kicking over into uh, real products. And this is why I'm so interested in healthcare. I believe all this stuff uh, is, uh, is really about to pop, not just because I hear these stories about exponential trends and so on and so forth, but because I see so many people excited about it and going, this is just so damn cool. All right, thanks very much.